I'm here with Craig Bramshire of like, Bramo. Right. And this is the uh, Inertia Electrical Bike. Very exciting motorcycle. Thanks. Tell us about it. Well, we, we uh, felt like the right opportunity for an electric vehicle where technology is today is really in a motorcycle. You know, it's like the battery technology there, the motor technology and everything's there. Uh, we think cars are still a few years off. We need more energy density, you know, and lighter weight, so, and cost to come down. So we started from scratch and really said, what does a motorcycle want to be if it's an electric motorcycle? And it, it ended up, uh, we achieved a lot of differences in terms of the chassis. So we have a carbon monocoque chassis, which in production will be an aluminum chassis, but it allowed us to quickly prototype the concept that allowed us to have a very lightweight structure that would allow us to put a lot of batteries in. The challenge behind an electric motorcycle is, versus a regular motorcycle, is with a regular motorcycle you pack it around the drivetrain and around the engine, and then you fit the fluids in everywhere else. And with this, you really have to pack it around the battery. So that's why it's a different design. It looks different, and yet at the same time, we want to make sure that the bike was really uh, paid an homage to where it's coming from. We didn't want it to look so Tron or Space Age that it wasn't realistic in terms of uh, people's approachability. So the first bike that we're doing is, is this one here, which is really designed to be uh, designed for the sustainable customer. The customers are really kind of understand that they want to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And it's also designed for people that have always wanted a motorcycle, but when they actually went into a Honda shop or Harley shop or something, they were a little too intimidated by the clutch and gears and all the operational, not to mention the weight. So this is a 275 pound bike, so it's, and most of the weight is down between your feet. So it's really easy to ride. If you can ride a bicycle, you can probably ride this motorcycle. Although you need the entitlement, but as far as the skill set required, that's really all you need. Uh, lots of questions there popping up as far as uh, the, uh, the um, sort of the connection between motorcycles that have come before. What kind of design clues can you point out uh, where, where you think that is evident? Well, one, one of the things, if you notice how narrow the bike is through the saddle area, if you can grip the bike with your legs, it tends to give you a feeling of confidence as opposed to having your legs splayed wide like on some of the scooters that are there. And so we look to some of the 60s and 70s trials bikes like the Montessa and bikes like that that actually were designed for slow speed use initially. but. We figured in an urban environment, people would be hopping curbs and putting this in bike racks and doing all kinds of, you know, kind of unique things, getting it to a plug wherever that may be. So we wanted to make sure it was very nimble and easy to move around. So that, that was a big part of it. And we also wanted to make sure that we avoided things like a hub motor. Um, the reason being is that the unsprung weight, even though theoretically it makes a lot of sense to reduce complexity of putting a hub motor in the wheel, you run through a you know deep pothole and you're going to know what's going on. You've got 20 or 30 or 50 pounds in your wheel. It handles completely different. So we wanted to make sure this was a very, very comfortable bike to ride, very nimble and easy to move around traffic. Uh, additionally, we're uh, the last engineering thing we're looking at is whether we're going to go to a belt or not. We're looking at that for that. It's probably a 50-50 chance at this point to go belt. Um, the chain's terribly efficient, but belts are really quiet and low maintenance. So if we put the belt on, we pretty much go to tires and brakes are the only issues around maintenance. Additionally, we have a, um, uh, we're not sure if it's going to be optional or built in, but we have a Wi-Fi connection for this. So you can actually log on to the bike from, as long as you have it near a Wi-Fi port, you can go to a website, go to bramo.com, log on to my bike, and you'll be able to update the changes. So for instance, we ship the bike with 60% of the performance available, which gives you maximum range. If it turns out you only go 15 miles every day and you don't care about the range and you'd like to go a little faster, or accelerate a little quicker, you can upgrade that performance. Uh, additionally, you'll be able to download, because we have a GPS chip on there, documentation of where you've been if you want to, if there's a point in the future where carbon credits require an audit trail, we, we want to be, you know, carbon ready for that. Not to mention that there's a community effect of, we believe that people that ride this are going to be interested in communicating how much carbon they've saved over their friends who maybe drive a Hummer or something like that. So, you know, bragging rights, kind of the Prius effect for bikes, if you will definitely stands out. I think it, you would pretty much notice his bike on the road. Um, the shipping it was 60% power and then the upgrade would cost extra or would just be a chance for you to change it how you want it? Yeah, yeah. Individuals will be able to change it. We'd probably put in a little bit of intelligence in there which maybe captures your last 20 trips and says, well, you've only been traveling 12 miles a trip and you've been waiting eight hours between charges anyway and charging every night. So 
one, do you feel comfortable with the performance of the bike? If so, leave it alone. You know, maybe, maybe not. It's like uh, you'd like a little bit more performance. We'd suggest you dial it up and try it, you know, things like that. So it'll still be with an acceptable safe range, but it'll be something that individual users can modify based on their usage. And it kind of grows with you then. It, that's, the, that's the concept. Uh, additionally, we're working on some programs around how to make sure that the batteries um, are similar to what you do with a PC in terms of upgrading it. We know that there's billions of dollars chasing the battery market, so um, Valence is already talking about increased energy density and new generations of batteries, so we want to make sure that there's a tremendous opportunity for people to upgrade without a significant cost increase, so we're working on programs around upgrade and recycling of batteries. Well, that leads to the big important questions of uh, what kind of batteries are in there, what kind of specs do we see, and cost. Right. Yeah. The, the, uh, these are lithium iron phosphate, which we believe are the safest batteries on the market. Valence, the reason we've chosen them is because they are the first ones that really had a good, well-packaged, ready-to-go in, in a vehicle ready today. Um, you know, there's a lot of battery manufacturers here today that are all saying, we can do that for you, but it's going to take a year of integration to make it work in your, your package. So Valence, they're already UL listed, which helps us a lot in terms of getting it homologated, NITs approved and everything. So that, that that's a big part of it. And we have a uh, total of six batteries in here that are each 12 volt pack, so it's a 72 volt uh, system with about 3.1 kilowatt hours of energy in it. So it's roughly about a 25 horsepower package, and you end up getting about 40 to 45 mile range. Depends a little bit, of course, on uh, you know. I'm going to get a little less range than other people because I'm a you know petite fella, but it's uh, it, it has a little bit a little bit of impact on it from from that aspect. But we've tested it in cities like Portland and San Francisco pretty extensively, so we haven't done the scenario where we say, oh, it's, you know, you get 45 miles as long as it's flat downhill in Nevada. You know, we're not, we're not doing that kind of testing, so it's real world uh, okay. range. And the question of cost? Uh, right, right now? Yeah, no, it's, we're actually taking orders for the bike. We just uh, announced it not too long ago, and it's 11995 okay. for the production one. We do have, uh, I think, about 60 of the pr uh, limited edition bikes left. We're only doing 99 of those, and those are 14995 but those are completely carbon fiber except for the chassis. So, okay. Uh, and those will be serialized in kind of a limited edition collector's yeah. bike. So you've got maybe 80 or so orders for those, would you say? Or? Uh, let's see. Yeah, we've got uh, 35 for the limited edition and about 100, a little bit over 100 for the production one. Okay. Yeah. And what are you what are you hoping to, to move into as far as production numbers? Or we're planning for up to 2000 and 2008 for mostly in the tail end of the year, and then and then move as quickly as we can to 10,000 units a year. Okay. What else should uh, Autoblog Green readers and uh, now viewers of their videos uh, know about about the uh, inertia bike? Uh, you know, one of the things that we're, we we believe is a, a big part of. The company's mission is to educate people on what an electric vehicle can do for the environment. So the simple numbers that we're looking at is if we can sell 100,000 bikes over a period of time, it could save a billion pounds of carbon that doesn't go into the air. So in order to understand how much you can contribute to that, our goal, we're about to launch a web, uh, web presence and we'll send it to you to make sure it's on the Auto Blog Green site where we've got a beta test for a carbon calculator specifically telling you compared to your existing vehicle how much carbon you can save. And so, for example, I have a Toyota a FJ Cruiser and if I drive it about 15,000 miles a year, if I drive the inertia half the time, I'll save about 7,500 pounds of carbon in the, in the, in over the course of that year, and I'll save $1,600 in fuel. So uh, we want people to understand that and play with that and give us feedback as to how valuable that information is. So lot, lots of forward thinking there with interactivity and connectivity and yeah, we, carbon. We, <laughs> we're, we're definitely, uh, you know, it was one of those things where we set out because we thought it was cool initially and then we became educated and then we realized it moved from a great business idea to a moral obligation. Um, you know, we've probably seen the inconvenient truth too many times, but you know, it's, it's really, really a case where we believe that companies like us can really make a big difference and have an impact on, on what happens to our kids' worlds in the future. All right. Well, Craig, thank you very much for seeing us on Blog Green. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. Sorry, excuse me.